Good evening. Um, my name is Meredith. And I am this year's president of the PTA. Um, Marie, wave at me if you can hear me. <laughs> Just so I'm okay, thanks. Um, I'm not as familiar with Zoom as my children are, but you know what? I get to learn tonight, I guess. Um, I wanted to welcome, welcome everybody, um, all of our parents and staff who have decided to join us this evening. Um, and I'd like to thank Drs. Mitchell and Ms. Callister for allowing the PTA to use the school district's Zoom platform um, to present this presentation tonight. Um, I'm just gonna read off a couple of things that the PTA has going on currently uh, really quickly. We have a readathon that's scheduled for over winter break. Um, everybody should have received an email and there's a link where you can sign up your child. Um, you can use the fundraising portion. Um, that's what we're looking to do. But we're also looking to see how many minutes we can get our kids to read. We want to log in minutes. So if you haven't done that, um, try and do that. Uh, the minutes we're not trying to start until winter break starts. And then we're going to do that for that two weeks. Um, there's prizes attached uh, as far as the pledges go. So those are directly through the Readathon website and they'll ship directly to your house if your child chooses to participate. Um, let's see, oh, five below next Monday, the 14th through next Saturday, the 19th, five below is letting us do a fundraiser. So if you need to purchase any stocking stuffers or in my case, more phone chargers constantly, um, the PTA will get 10% of each purchase if you show them a picture of the flyer. Um, you need to show them a picture of the flyer, so just keep it on your phone and do that if you're planning on buying anything from Five Below anyhow. Uh, lastly, we have um, a spirit wear store that is up and running throughout the year for each school. Uh, this month of December, it's 10% off of flannel pajama pants, um, which I've already purchased each of my kids because nothing says a little bit of comfort more than flannel pants. They go with remote learning, they go with winter, they're great. Um, so my kids are very excited about that. Uh, let's see, what else did I have? Not much, it's never too late to become a member of the PTA. You can go to our website and do it through there. Um, the school can also, or the district can also get you a link if you can't find our website, but you should be able to, it's pretty easy. Google Homewood PTA and you'll find it. Um, now on to the presentation part. Uh, yesterday, my kids were playing Uno after school and they were getting along really well. After a few games though, they started bickering as kids do. And I said, knock it off, it's only a card game. Without missing a beat, my second grade son turns to me and says, mom, life is a hard game. He mistook when I said card for hard. And um, he said, life is a hard game. He's not wrong. This year has been uh, taxing for so many of us, not just our kids, but ourselves. Um, and right now we're entering and we're into, we're deep into the shortening days. The, you know, we're missing our daylight. It's cold, it's winter. Um, many of us haven't gone out or socialized in a very long time anyway. And, uh, and we're not all gonna be seeing our extended families and loved ones over this winter break. Um, this is why I'm so grateful that Ms. Marie Goulet <laughs> agreed to do this presentation for us this evening. Um, without further ado, I'll let Marie take it from here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Meredith. Um, hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in on a Wednesday night um, after I'm sure what has been a very full day um, for some of you on Zoom all day. So uh, definitely, you know, appreciate you taking some time out um, for yourself to, to tune in tonight. I am going to share my screen here um, and get us started. All right. 
Um, so I think everyone hopefully knows that they're in the in the right place. Um, we're here tonight to talk about holiday blues in the time of COVID, but we're we're gonna we're gonna cover um, a lot more than that. Um, I, I really like this slide. I think this kind of sums sums up our presentation right here. It's the worst Monday ever, and it's not even Monday. Um, if if you're like me, most of your weeks right now feel like you know Mondays could be Fridays, Wednesdays could be Sundays. You know we're we're kind of on Vegas time right now and we're not really sure um, what's top or what's what's bottom. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about really, really fun, exciting topics. Uh, we're going to talk about stress and depression and anxiety and compassion fatigue. Um, and we're going to put some useful, practical, positive coping skills in there. And we're going to discuss holidays just a little bit. Um, so um, one of the things that I really want to start off with is, is really just opening up a dialogue that everyone's reaction right now to this pandemic um, is different. Some people are loving this extra time at home. Some people are hating this extra time at home. Um, some people uh, don't really believe there is a pandemic and they haven't been affected by it. Um, and other people have lost people that they love. So we're, we're really um, on the spectrum as far as our own personal reactions to it. Um, and there isn't a right and there isn't a wrong. The, the biggest thing that I, I hope you take away from tonight is that social distancing does not equal social isolation. Um, we have had to learn things on the fly as parents and educators um, and, and learning how to educate and, and teach our children in a completely new way. And I'm in awe every single day of um, what we are accomplishing. Uh, the other big takeaway is really focusing on our protective factors and what we can control. When, when things are out of control, it's very, very easy to drown in that. Um, but if we can focus on the things that we have power over, making sure our basic needs are met, making sure we're allowing ourselves to get some emotional support, making sure we're finding ways to stay connected in a different way and practicing self-care. Um, so who am I? Why, why am I here? Why am I talking? Um, so as Meredith said, my name is Marie Goulet. Um, I, I live in Homewood. I am a parent of an awesome fourth grader in the Homewood schools. Um, and above and beyond that, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm the assistant director of special education um, in New Lenox School District 122. So I have been working with children, adolescents, and their families in both a clinical and school setting for about 18 years, which is a little um, overwhelming when I think about that number. Um, and two really important things to know about me. Um, one, I am a new cancer survivor. Um, I'm, I'm coming up on uh, December will be my anniversary of finishing chemo, and then I had treatment all throughout the spring um, but it's given me, I, I think, a very unique lens on dealing with the pandemic and COVID-19 and social isolation. I had a little bit of a head start on that than everyone else did. So um, I, I think for me, that mindset has been everything. And we will talk about mindset a lot. Um, and I have anxiety. Um, I've had anxiety my entire life was diagnosed in my early 20s, and it was an aha moment to be able to really put an explanation and a label to things that I had been dealing with my whole life. Um, in my clinical work, I, I have always told my kids, um, anxiety is something that you have to make work for you, um, and we get into trouble when we're working for it, and that's true with anything. Um, so I know um, we don't have the chat open, but if uh, the, I believe the question and answers um, portion of the Zoom is open. So please feel free to, to comment in the you know, question and answer box. Let me know um, who you are. Um, I know we're all uh, parents and professionals and um, family members, and I'm sure different ages are represented. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're all homewood people. Um, so that's a, a thing that bonds us together. 
Um, and then also feel free to let me know what you are hoping to get from tonight. Um, so we're definitely going to talk about those healthy coping skills for anxiety, stress, depression, compassion, fatigue. Um, and we're going to talk about navigating the holidays. So if there's anything above and beyond, feel free to type in that question box at, at any point and I'll do my best to try to keep up with that. So language is really important. Um, it's, it's vital. It's, it's really the foundation for everything. Um, so notice in my introduction, I said that I have anxiety. Um, I know a lot of people um, with mental health issues that like to say I'm battling with or I'm suffering with. Um, and not to diminish that at all, because there is, again, no right or wrong. It's, it's what's comfortable for an individual. Um, but language really informs how we react to things. So if I say I have anxiety, to me, it's no different than I have asthma um, or, you know, um, I have a heart condition. It's a, it's a medical diagnosis that unfortunately in this day and age, we're still battling stigma over. So I really work very hard to try to take that stigma away um, with, using, with using language. Um, we're not defined by a label or a diagnosis. Um, we're only defined by our experience. Um, and then mostly we're defined by how we respond. So that's where that positive mindset comes in. And again, we're going to get into details a lot later. But, but my favorite phrase, it's really my mantra, is yes and. Uh, when we're tasked with a question or we're faced with a challenge, um, it's very easy to go um, into, into a negative response. Well, yes, but, right, and, and that closes the door on any possibilities versus if we have a yes and mentality, it really opens the door for what is possible. Ms. Goulet? Yes. So, sorry to interject. Hi, oh. everyone. This is Dr. McAllister. I just want to let you know, Ms. Goulet, I'll be monitoring the question and answer oh, for great. you. Thank so things, you. Yeah, as things come in, I'll just mention those to you. So one of our attendees, Perfect. who is a teacher assistant and also a parent, just looking to get some information on how to help my kids uh, through their emotions. So I just Perfect. thought I'd share that as you go through. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much. That's great. And we will definitely talk about um, everything that we're going to do tonight. And I'm going to walk you through. Um, some things are specifically designed for, for kids, um, and some things are um, applicable to all age groups. So I will definitely point out. So anything that we're doing together, you can definitely do with your kiddos. So I just want to invite everyone, hopefully you are already sitting in a, in a comfy chair, um, but I just want to invite you to release your shoulders from your ears. Sometimes we hold our shoulders up here and we hold all, all of our tension. So I just want to invite you to just relax those shoulders unclench your jaw, drop the tongue from the roof of your mouth, and just take in a nice, big, deep breath. Um, we're going to talk about breath a lot tonight, um, and breath is really just like language. It's foundational for everything. I think we tend to rush through the day breathing because we have to breathe versus breathing in a really thoughtful, purposeful way. So, you know, this is not news to anyone. We know that we're all dealing with challenges right now. There's been major changes in education and healthcare and our routines and employment. Um, people that have had pre-existing conditions or health vulnerabilities um, are facing even more barriers and challenges. Um, social isolation and loneliness is a real thing, especially for our kids. Um, it's, it's really challenging right now to navigate um, mental health and physical health um, and, and do those things at the same time. Um, there's definitely been an, an increase in interpersonal conflicts in the home. Like I said earlier, people are just not used to spending so much time in such close quarters. Um, those social supports are decreased. So something as simple as I'm going to go grab coffee with a friend um, and that's my typical go-to, you know, that's not as easy to do right now. Um, and then I just want to throw out an honorable mention to the political climate. Um, you know, whatever side of the fence you're on, that has been 
um, very, very present and in our faces and has taken a lot of energy um, for the past nine months along with COVID. So at the end of the day, what does that mean, right? It, it means that on some level, we are all experiencing um, a level of trauma. Um, you know, grief and loss can result in trauma and trauma changes the way that our brains are wired. Um, traumatic experiences do not have to equal a, a trauma response, um, but they definitely can. So trauma can definitely impact work and school performance. Um, you know, and I, I think about, again, our students uh, learning how to be students in a completely different way. Some of them are doing amazing and some of them are really struggling. Um, trauma can impact the way that you're able to pay attention, your memory, your cognition. It can interfere with basic problem solving strategies. It can result in overwhelming feelings of frustration and anxiety. I say, you know, we're just having some big feelings and feeling all the things. And so we have to figure out how to navigate our way through that. Um, trauma can result in some physical symptoms like an increase in headaches or stomach aches, um, poor control of emotions. Um, but, but trauma can, most importantly, be dealt with in a physically and emotionally responsive and proactive way. So just because all of these things are happening or maybe you recognize yourself in a few of those bullet points, um, it doesn't mean that there isn't a way to navigate it. So very, very quickly, I just want to talk about the brain. Um, I'm kind of a nerd. I'm really interested in, in the way that the brain works. Um, this is a picture of a healthy brain, and this is a picture of an abused brain. And, and while um, abuse is, is not what we're talking about tonight, a, a brain that is really suffering, suffering significant stress repeatedly, trauma, um, will, will mimic that abused brain. So if you look at those areas that are all lit up in the healthy brain and the temporal lobes versus those areas that are pretty dark um, and not so active in that um, trauma stress brain, it, it's fascinating. Again, trauma rewires our brains. Stress and anxiety rewire our brains. So thinking about, um, again, um, our kids, right? What, what can trauma look like, and our teachers <laughs> for that matter, um, what can trauma look like inside of the classroom? So we know um, we can see deficits in executive functioning. So that means that problem solving, um, planning, organization, all of those skills can be impacted. We can see an increase in aggression, um, which really just means that our fuse is a little bit shorter. Things that we used to have a tolerance for, we no longer have a tolerance for. Um, anxiety. Um, and in kids, anxiety can appear in a lot of different ways. You know, I, I think um, people without anxiety tend to think anxiety looks like um, you know, I'm really nervous, I'm, you know, pacing, I'm picking my nails, I'm, you know, whatever it is that we think it looks like, but it manifests in so many different ways. And so um, knowing where your baseline is really helps you to know if something's different. So I think about our kids and anxiety can come across in them being really withdrawn and shy, or it could come across in them being kind of snappy and snippy and a little bit more emotional than usual. Um, trauma can also impact language and make that um, expressive and receptive language. So what information is being taken in and what information is being put out, um, we can see deficits in our students in that. And then ultimately distraction. You know, we're, we're, we're tasking our learners to learn in a very different way and asking them to sit and be on a screen and do things that are, are not normal for their, for their development. Their bodies need to move. Our bodies need to move. Um, and we're really asking a lot of them right now. So it, it's not surprising that it may result in some of these things. Hey, Ms. Goulet, thank you. Uh, one of the questions that came in is related to how do we help our kids. And uh, one of our attendees said, I'm looking for ways to help my college student without nagging them. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
I know every, that's something you'll talk about. But yes, every every parent's question. Thank you so much. Yeah, every parent's question, right? How do you provide support and boundaries without nagging? And I was just having this conversation earlier today about um, about that very thing about. Um, boundaries, um, you know, versus like discipline, um, but boundaries. So we will definitely, we will definitely get to some of those strategies. Thank you. Keep the questions coming. So some things we can do about trauma, um, as much as possible, just maintaining our typical routines. And again, th the typical might be new now, you know, um, so, so figuring out what, what is our typical routine and having a schedule. Um, and for a lot of people, for whether it's an adult, whether it's a second grader, whether it's your college student, really having a visual schedule um, really, really is beneficial. So some people love having the calendars on their phone. Some people really love planners. Some people love posters. But anything that you can visually see a representation of your day um, can also really help you stay on track. Um, that's why to-do lists are so great. Um, if you're like me, you um, will make to-do lists and then you'll write them over 10 times because you either have to add something um, or you just want that satisfaction of putting something on there that you've already done so you can cross it off. Um, we want to provide choices. Uh, when, when we're in a trauma and anxiety and stress brain, we feel like a lot of our power has been taken away. So I, I like to talk about controlled choices. So if you have, um, you know, your son or daughter um, and you don't really care which one they do, you know, do you want to work on math or do you want to work on reading, right? Do you want to clean your room or do you want to take the garbage out? You know, so it's, it's things that we want them to do and we're good with whatever they choose, but it's giving that controlled choice so that they have a sense of power that they're deciding what they want to do. Um, do you need to take a five-minute break or do you need to take a three-minute break, right? Um, so really, again, just providing those controlled choices. We want to increase our levels of support. Right now, um, again, is not a time to be weathering the storm by yourself. So really recognizing maybe when it is time to reach out for some additional supports, um, providing that structure and boundaries. Um, we all have different parenting styles and there again is not a wrong or a right, um, but doing this for so long, working with adolescents for a very long time, um, I, I worked for several years um, in, in a high school setting and the, the biggest commonality I found with, with parenting um, adolescents who were struggling was needing to put in those boundaries. Um, and so um, to the question of feeling like, how do we do that without nagging? It, it really is that role of right now, I am not your friend, I am your parent. And um, I wanna sit and I wanna work with you and figure out what you need and how we can get you what you need. Um, and so for our, for our older kids, we can engage them in that conversation. And for our younger kids, it's us kind of knowing and putting in those boundaries for them. And we'll get to that um, in some more detail as well. Being aware of the signs, right? As I was reading those descriptions, did that sound like any of you? Did that sound like any of your kiddos? Um, and then self-care will be especially important for that. And one of the biggest, easiest things we can do is limit our time on social media and media in general. Um, right now, we're being bombarded with information every single day, and it's very useful, important information. Um, but you can get that information in 10 or 15 minutes instead of getting it for hours and hours and hours. Um, and then with regard to social media, I don't know how many of you start your day on your cell phone because it's next to your bed, or how many of you end your day on your cell phone because it's next to your bed. Um, but, but there's been a lot of research done about how our brain actually responds to um, being on our phones, whether it's checking email, whether it's um, going down the TikTok rabbit hole, whatever it is. Um, when we start our day that way, we're, we're putting um, a certain energy on our day. 
And when we're ending our day that way, we're not allowing our brains to relax and respond. Um, so let's get into the nitty gritty of anxiety a little bit. Um, I am sure you can all think of examples of very typical fears and worries. So typical fears and worries are very normal. So things like fear of injury, fear of, um, you know, financial difficulties, fear of health, um, fear of transitions or fear of COVID, right? Those are all very natural, normal responses. Anxiety is a natural, normal response. It's an adaptive response that our bodies have to let us know when we are in danger or perceived danger. Uh, the challenge with anxiety though comes when our bodies are telling us that there's a danger and there is not a real danger. So again, another, another picture of the brain to kind of just explain how it works really, really fast. So we've got, you know, if you, if you think of like your hand as your brain, you know, we've got like our, our front brain, our prefrontal cortex, and this is the area of the brain that is responsible for um, logical thoughts, right? And then we have like our, our middle brain here, which is our, um, our, the area of our brain um, that amplifies negative thoughts and negative information and helps you pay attention to your surroundings. And then we have our amygdala. And our amygdala is really, really what is in charge of that flight, fight, or freeze response. So, you know, in, in a typical brain, we see or sense danger, right? So we see that big bear in the forest. Our amygdala, that middle brain, tells us to run. And you follow those directions and you run. Although some people will want to fight and some people will freeze. Those are basic stress responses. But if your thinking brain, if your front brain, if that prefrontal cortex is in charge, um, you are able to, to rationally think, you're able to stay in charge. Um, but what happens a lot of time with stress and anxiety is that front brain gets frozen and we're not really able to think um, in logical terms. So we have to train our brain. Um, we have to tell our brain what to do and how to think. And the awesome part of our brain is that we can do that. We can, we can retrain our brain. We can be aware of what our triggers are and we can be aware of how we respond to them and we can retrain our brain. Um, so typical stress, anxiety responses, you know, our physical responses for some people, it's that onset of a headache, just kind of feeling overall restless and irritable. Um, it's the psychological, um, so that excessive fear and worry, inability to concentrate, um, racing thoughts, and then sometimes we have those behavioral symptoms as well. So if we know both in ourselves and our children, if we know what that baseline is, is what, what, what typical is, um, then we can really be aware if something starts to look a little bit different. So I, you know, I, I, I really like this graphic of um, anxiety, you know, so what you see, somebody who's always on time or with a strong work ethic or good at planning or super helpful, um, but what they feel is very different. So it's like that duck being on top of water and you just see them swimming along, but underneath their little feet are paddling, paddling, paddling. Um, so, um, you know, what, what people see on the outside versus what um, is felt on the inside can, can usually be pretty, pretty different. Um, but again, I like to say, you know, look at all of these, these positives on the left side, um, anxiety can really work for you. So I would like to invite everyone just to take a moment to sit up nice and tall wherever you're sitting, put your feet flat on the floor, put your hands in your lap. Um, if you're comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, just find a soft gaze somewhere in front of you. And then take in a nice, slow, deep breath. And then exhale. And then on your next breath, I want you to really try to breathe all the way from your diaphragm. So all the way from the bottom of your lungs, as opposed to breathing shallowly. And take a nice, big, deep breath in. 
take a little pause at the top and then slowly exhale. And on your next breath in, right at that pause before you exhale, I want you to notice where in your body you hold your stress. Do you hold your stress in your shoulders or in your neck or your stomach? Or do you have a little knot in your back that just never goes away? Where, where do you hold your stress? And on your next inhale and exhale, I want you to really focus on that area and try to get that breath in there. And then if you have closed your eyes, I will invite you to open your eyes back up. Um, so we talked about breathing as function, something that our bodies do all on their own. Um, the quickest way to calm down, whether it's you or whether it's your kiddo who you notice is a little anxious or stressed, the biggest, easiest way to calm down is to get a couple deep breaths. Um, oxygen works mysterious ways and it really does help to calm down that stress. And we're gonna talk about a couple more activities in a minute. The next thing I want you to think about is, are you shooting all over yourself? Do you think all day long about what I should be doing? Um, I should do this. I need to do that. I should do that. Um, are, are you causing more harm than good with, with those thoughts? Um, would it be more helpful, to, again, to write that to-do list and cross it off and, and really have some realistic expectations about what you are able to accomplish? Some days we can cross one thing off the list, some days 10, and some days just getting up and taking a shower is an accomplishment. Um, in a hurricane, I, I like this analogy of being an oak tree or a palm tree. I think we're all really sold the message that um, we need to be a strong oak tree that's very rooted. Um, but in a hurricane, the palm trees do so well because they're flexible. They're able to roll with the punches. Um, they're able to bounce back. Um, so just thinking about that analogy, and sometimes I think we put a little bit too much pressure on ourselves. And then the other thing to think about is what, what takes your energy mm -hmm. away from you and what gives you energy. Um, we spend a lot of time, I think, on things that take our energy and not enough time on what gives us energy. Um, and I ask a lot of people that I work with, both parents and students, what gives you energy? Um, and that's not an easy question to answer. So if that's not an easy question to answer for you, I really challenge yourself to come up with a couple of things that give you energy. Mm -hmm. There is um, a, a Native American fable um, about the, a good wolf versus a bad wolf. And, and I, I just love this so much and I'm not gonna tell it correctly, but the, the gist of it is that there's um, a child talking to a grandparent um, and the grandparents talking about, you know, there are two wolves in, in all of us and we have our good wolf and that is um, love and compassion and loyalty and, and um, all of the positive qualities. Um, and then the bad wolf is, you know, envy and fear and anger and hate and, and all of those more negative qualities. And they're constantly at war with each other. You know, and so the grandchild asks the grandparent, well, which, which wolf is going to win? And the grandparent simply replies, whichever wolf you feed more. Um, so again, that goes back to that energy, right? What, what's taking our energy versus what's giving us energy? There are so many apps now um, for, you know, specifically for anxiety. Um, the Calm app, although that, you know, that is not a free one. Um, Headspace, I don't have that on here. Um, there's an Insight app, Mindfulness Reminder. I mean, you can go to your app store, or you can Google, um, you know, apps for anxiety, and there's so many of them, and they really, really are um, nice and beneficial, and um, whether it's a guided meditation, whether it's a bedtime story, um, there's a lot of different um, things that you can do with those apps. One of the biggest ways to deal with stress and anxiety mm -hmm. is to practice mindfulness. 
So um, very quickly, mindfulness really is just paying attention on purpose in a particular way to the present. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking about all, all of the things you need to do before bed tonight, you know, really just kind of stopping and, and pausing, like, interesting, I, I'm really thinking a lot about all of these things that I have to do. Um, and then one of two things can happen. We can think about um, with judgment, you know, why did I wait to the last minute? Why didn't I start this earlier? Or we can simply think about it non-judgmentally of, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really worried about these things. Um, I, you know, I wonder what, what will happen. Um, if we're approaching things from a more mindful way, we're just noticing it. We're not judging it. Um, and then we're able to like ride that wave a little bit out of the panic. Um, so then we can get back to that, uh, that thinking brain and come up with a plan. Versus if we're just so carried away in our thoughts, then we don't, we go down that rabbit hole a little bit. Um, so, um, you know, mindfulness, much like anything else, is a practice. You're never going to be fully mindful. You're never going to approach things from a fully mindful manner. It's just practicing all of the time. Um, so one of the biggest questions I get about anxiety is how do, how do I stop? How do I stop my brain um, when, when it won't turn off? Um, and the answer is, is you really don't stop it. You learn how to control it. Um, so this is just a, a nice little graphic of a couple ideas that you can do. Um, really trying to mm -hmm. have your body be comfortable or, or give yourself or your students a little bit of a, a movement break. Um, letting those thoughts come and go um, instead of judging them. Um, really stepping back from your thoughts sometimes, trying to distract, and we'll talk about ways to distract in a little bit. Um, when, when do we do something about anxiety? So like any mental health issue, um, whether it's anxiety or depression or anything, when, when it starts to interfere with our activities of daily living and functioning, when the intensity and duration are increasing, when it's out of proportion, um, when it doesn't go away, and when it really impacts, impacts your life, then, then it might be time to get some outside support. Um, some signs that you've got a lot of stress and anxiety, if you're having recurrent fears and worries, if you're having difficulty falling and staying asleep. And again, we see all these things in, in adults and children. Um, if you're having a hard time relaxing, um, sometimes we can see it manifest in kiddos with that separation anxiety. And that's going to be um, pretty big in the next few months um, when we're able to return to a more typical schedule after we've all been together for so long. Um, I really think we're going to see a lot of separation anxiety come, come up. Um, again, irritability and dysregulation and that inability to recover. So one of the distinctions between stress and anxiety, um, because they really do mimic each other, stress is, is short term. Stress has an identifiable trigger. We, we know what's causing that. We, we know why we're feeling stress. Um, anxiety, however, can stick around and it might not always have an identifiable trigger. There, there may not be something that caused that anxiety. Um, I, I like this. Who needs sleep when you have anxiety, right? I didn't get much sleep, but I got a few hours of anxiety in. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the types of anxiety disorders, um, but there are multiple. The, the, the most um, common one being generalized anxiety disorder, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, we um, don't have a clear antecedent for things. We can kind of look at the world and worry about everything. Um, at least three of the following symptoms are present, that poor concentration, fatigue, difficulty sleeping, um, muscle or motor tension. Um, it, it may be very significant to you, but other people might not even be aware that that's happening in you. Um, a lot of time we see it paired with those perfection, perfect, I can't even say the word, perfectionistic behaviors. 
um, people pleasing, um, some of those somatic complaints. Um, so that's just a, a very general definition of generalized anxiety disorder. We have separation anxiety disorder. And again, we see this a lot with children. Um, I'll let you kind of just read, read through that. One of the biggest pieces of separation anxiety disorder actually can manifest in school refusal. Um, there's social anxiety disorder, again, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, I think we're seeing an increase of this now, um, especially with going into public. Um, but then that's tied in a little bit to that specific phobia. Um, and then we get more into that OCD end of the spectrum of really thinking about those repetitive thoughts and then practicing those behaviors to get rid of those thoughts. Um, so again, what, what, what do we do, right? We, we pause, we breathe, very simple things, but very simple things are effective. Um, we take breaks from COVID-19 content. We make time to get some sleep and exercise, which I understand is way more easily said than done. And we'll talk about some strategies for that in a minute. Um, we reach out and we stay connected, even if it looks different, um, even if it's over Zoom or the phone or, you know, writing an actual letter to someone. Um, we just have to think about how to stay connected in a different way. And then ultimately getting some help if, if we're feeling like we need some extra support. So I think about um, exercising in particular. Um, and I think for a lot of us, it's the first thing that goes by the wayside um, because we just don't have time for it, right? We think we have to work out for an hour for it to count. And I actually heard the other morning, I mean, I heard on the radio, so it must be true, um, but that it's like something like 11 minutes a day of exercise really makes a significant difference. So sometimes it's not having an hour to dedicate. Sometimes it's having 10 minutes. Um, so a couple of things that you can do, like I said earlier, plan your day, have a visual calendar. What, what do you need to get accomplished today? Um, enjoy your morning routine before you look at your phone. Really challenge yourself to be up and moving and living in the world before you check your phone. Um, things like reading before bed um, instead of being on your phone are really great for your brain. Meditating, again, not for everybody, but it's really something that can help your brain kind of untangle and unwind. Um, I really like this thought of taking pictures and or looking at existing pictures that make you happy. Um, journaling, writing things down, um, and then it says hug someone you love with your whole heart. And right now, um, we just, we can't do that um, with everyone. Um, this is my favorite activity. Um, I use it with my students all the time um, and it's really effective. Um, you can do it anywhere and it's free. So if you or your kiddo is just feeling overwhelmed um, by anything or needing a break or um, just, you know, needing a coping skill, this, um, this grounding activity is really great. So it's all about slowing down, taking those nice big deep breaths that we practiced doing earlier, and then looking around. I love um, doing this activity outside if possible. Um, on, on a walk in nature um, because it's a lot easier. But if you can't get outside, you can do this, you know, in your dining room. So think about what are five things that you can see. And when I do this and I ask students to do it, I typically ask them to identify five things of the same color because it makes it a little easier for them to find objects. So what are five things in the room that you are in that are the color green? Um, what are four things that you can feel, right? So what are, what are different um, things that will really get that tactile? So you can feel your sweater, you can feel the material of the chair you're sitting on, you can, you know, feel the outside of your laptop or your phone, right? What are four things that you can actually physically touch and feel? And then what are three things that you can hear? Right, so you can hear the sound of my voice. I can hear the sound of the um, game controller because I've bribed my son with Xbox um, and I can hear the heat um, that is on right now. 
Um, and then what are two things that you can smell? Um, smell is, is a very, very um, easy way to connect to your senses. And then what is one thing, if you could taste anything in the world right now that would make you so happy, what would that be? And so this is just a really quick grounding activity that you can do anywhere. Um, the next one is progressive muscle relaxation. This one is really great um, if you are having a hard time getting to sleep. So it really, again, just starts with those nice deep breaths and then you start at the bottom and work your way to the top. So you start at your feet, squeezing them, you know, as tight as you can, holding that for five seconds and then relaxing. And then just working your way up, you know, your legs, your back, your arms, your shoulders, your face, um, just kind of going all the way up. Um, you know, usually that would take about five to 10 minutes, depending on how long you were taking with each, each section of your body. But this is also a great thing to do with kids. Um, it doesn't have to be when you're going to bed, it can be in the middle of the day. When you just see that they're tense, um, this is a great thing to say like, all right, let's start from the bottom of the top and let's go through. Um, and this is a nice little movement break as well. The other thing that we can really do is practice positive self-talk and self-compassion. Um, your thoughts become your reality. Although I did learn a few months ago that not everyone thinks in words, um, which was really bizarre to me because I don't even know what that would be like. Um, but but choosing, you know, choosing which which words you're going to listen to and which words you're you're going to acknowledge and and let go. Um, and thinking about, you know, what what would you say to a friend? Um, if, if a friend were to come to you and confide things in you, most likely you would tell them, you know, I've got you, right? You're safe. You're not alone. This is difficult. Um, so why, why do we not speak to ourselves the same way that we would speak to a friend? Um, and, and I love this one when um, anyone is feeling very overwhelmed. It's a very simple reminder. Put your hand over your heart and feel your heartbeat. You are here. Um, whatever it is that is happening around you is not bigger than the fact that you are here in this moment. Um, and when those moments become very overwhelming, stop and ask yourself, what, what do you need? What do you need in that moment? Um, what do I need from other people? What do I need from myself? What do I need to hear? What do I need to do? Um, and then that can help you maybe um, give yourself some words for meditations. You know, may I feel peaceful. <laughs> um, may I receive the energy that I need, what, whatever it is. Um, and then really just allowing yourself a few minutes to breathe in all of those things that you need and to really breathe out all of the things that are not serving you and that you don't need. Hey, Maria. Yes. Hey, just, just a quick question for you uh, that came in. Uh, so many great tips here. Are you going to be sharing these or making these slides available? Because uh, I know I've been writing things down and taking yeah. pictures myself. That's so, a great, that's a great yeah. question. I, I absolutely can. Um, we just need to figure out logistically. I can um, email you my PowerPoint um, or Meredith my PowerPoint, how, however it, it, it works best to then share it out with everyone. Okay. But 100%, and I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that earlier because I'm, I'm the same way. I'm a screenshotter and a note taker, so I, I should have told all of you in the beginning, I am happy to share this, so um, don't worry about taking notes anymore, um, and so we'll, we'll figure out how to get it to you. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure out a way to make this public, uh, not only for the attendees tonight, but others who couldn't be with us because uh, there's so many great things. Thanks. Perfect. And I do know, too, that um, I, I did this presentation a few weeks ago for um, a community group that I am part of in New Lenox, where I work. Um, and I know that they posted the recording of that on YouTube, so I can do a little investigating and, and get that as well. Not that you want to like sit and watch me over and over again, but it's, it's fantastic. Similar, I'd, I'd watch it a similar, second time. Similar content, um, you know, and, and so we'll, we'll I'll get that link to you as well. Very good. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Um, so really quick, just kind of shifting into, into change, right? We, we all have change in our lives. We have expected and unexpected change. The expected is easier to navigate because we know it's coming, right? We know the, 
the weather's changing. We know what we have to do when that happens. Um, we know when we're going to have breaks in our schedules. But right now, we are in the midst of this very, very unexpected change. And that is challenging for people to deal with. Um, changes in routines and schedules from our typical, the inability to do things that we would typically do. Um, it is very, very hard. Um, so a, a lot of times when we're kind of in that, that chaos of change, that can lead to some feelings of depression. Um, so again, what's, what is depression, right? Um, very simple definition, it's a mood disorder and it, it results in a persistent feeling of sadness and the loss of interest. Again, everyone gets depressed from time to time. That's very natural and normal. Um, but, but when it becomes an issue is again, it's impacting our activities of daily living. It's causing us to lose interest in things that we used to be really interested in, or it's causing a really impactful lack of energy. So where does it come from, right? It comes from genetics. It comes from the way that our body is wired. And sometimes it can come from those traumatic events. Um, and then sometimes you win the lottery and it's coming from, from all of those places. Um, so again, some, some signs and symptoms, um, some similar to stress and anxiety, mm -hmm. um, but followed with that, you know, sometimes we were just feeling really hopeless and irritable and impatient for some people. Um, when it gets really intense, they can experience those suicidal thoughts and ideations. Um, and then really ultimately um, that behavioral manifestation, we're just not interested or avoiding um, angry and irritable, not sleeping or sleeping all of the time. So those are some, some indicators. Um, so again, we kind of talked about the, the why already. Um, so I'm gonna skip that. I have several slides in here. Um, about suicide, just because I felt remiss not to include them. But since I'm going to share the presentation, um, just being respectful of everyone's time, I am going to skip through the suicide slides because I feel like that could be a whole presentation on its own. Um, but so there is some information in there um, when, when you get the slides. And I want to move into compassion fatigue. Um, so some other names you'll hear about for compassion fatigue are vicarious trauma or burnout. Um, so when you're having, experiencing burnout or secondary or vicarious trauma, that can lead to that compassion fatigue. So really what it is, it's a very fancy way to say that you're emotionally withdrawn, you're exhausted um, from dealing with um, traumatized people or sick people, um, or people that are, are really kind of um, needing you to always be on. So as parents, right, does that, does that sound like you? You're always, always on. Um, and as professionals, compassion fatigue can really take a toll too when, when you're kind of holding everyone else's emotions. Um, it, it can really um, be detrimental to us. Again, you'll have these slides, but this is just a nice little graphic of just some distinctions between burnout, compassion fatigue, and vicarious trauma, but, but ultimately they're, they're all one of the same. So the most important part about that is I think everyone can recognize when they're anxious or stressed or burnt out or when your kids are feeling that way. So how, how do we fill up the tank? What, what do we do? How do we make it better? Um, the biggest thing we can do um, for all of those is identifying our triggers. What, what is causing it? Again, there won't always be a clear-cut cause, but if we can identify an antecedent, if we can identify that trigger, um, we can really kind of start to get on a different cycle of prevention instead of reaction. Um, so we can identify our triggers, we can have some positive coping skills that we can access really easily, and we can continue to educate ourselves about it. One of the best coping skills we can have is mindset. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, and then ultimately, if we're needing a little extra support, um, that's where mental health professionals come in, and we utilize things like cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy. And both of those things are really just fancy ways to say that we are retraining your brain to think and respond in a different way. 
So some basic coping skills, um, self-care, you know, I, I think there's a misnomer about self-care, meaning that we're taking bubble baths and, you know, sipping champagne and eating chocolate. And while that might be great, that's, that's not realistic. Um, so thinking about self-care in very small, manageable ways, um, thinking about moving your body and stretching your body. Um, we were talking earlier before the presentation started about the challenge right now of doing that. And I know um, the building where I work, we have all really started to, to try to wear our Fitbits and or just remind each other that like every hour we really need to get up and walk a couple laps. Um, one of my teams that I supervise, where we before the kids get there in the morning, we, we have some of our students still in person. Um, before they get there in the morning, we do 50 squats, you know, and then when they leave, we do 50 more squats. And it's something it takes three minutes to do, but it, we, we're really noticing, you know, two weeks in, it's making a big difference. So, so how can you just add little snippets in your day to move? Um, and then really ultimately thinking about what, what brings you joy and how can you get that into your day and thinking back to that it doesn't have to be for an hour. Um, it can be for 10 minutes. Another really basic coping skill is distraction. Um, you know, if you are just really stuck in those thoughts or your kiddos are just really stuck, um, you need a break. That's your, your brain's telling you you need a break. So do you need to put on some music? Do you need to read a book? Do you need to write things down in a journal? Whatever works for you, but really just distracting yourself from those thoughts. Then using those grounding activities, which we, we did one, so we have a nice example of that right now. Um, and then challenging those thoughts, right? What, what advice would you give someone else who is coming to you? Um, and then sometimes we just need a simple emotional release. <laughs> we need to yell and scream and cry. Um, that's, that's why our body has emotions. I think in, in our culture, we, we really have a misconception that we need to be happy and joyous and energetic all of the time. Human beings are made to experience a wide away, array of emotions. Um, and we're very quick mm -hmm. to, when we don't feel comfortable, we want to fix it. And we want to move you know, to a more comfortable state of being. Um, but the most important thing for you to take away from tonight is it is okay to be uncomfortable. Um, sometimes we just need to sit in the uncomfort, but that's where that mindful practice comes in of knowing this will not last forever. I am not going to feel this way forever. I'm feeling this way now. What do I need to do to shift and move out of it? Um, but not like shove it down and not deal with it because then it's still going to be there. So again, sometimes we need that release. We need to yell and cry and scream. And then we need to take a shower and turn up the music and have a dance party. Um, and then ultimately, the, the best coping skill is, is doing something nice for someone else, um, altruism, which is not altruistic at all. It's very selfish and that's okay because it's very beneficial. Um, so when we're kind of stuck in our own stuff, um, what, what can we do to be in service to others? And again, it doesn't have to be on a grand scale. It can be something as simple as smiling at another person, um, letting someone go ahead of you and not flipping them off in traffic. Um, or it can be bigger, like putting little notes on someone's car or writing someone a letter. Um, there are you know, bigger things that we can do. So this is just another graphic that goes into each one of those things um, in a little bit more detail, which you can check out um, when you're looking at this later. Um, and then that brings us into, into mindset. So mindset is everything. It's, it's how, you know, we talked about language being foundational. So mindset is, is really the extension of that. So if we have a fixed mindset, which really looks like we're just going to not even bother, we're not going to try, we're going to give up really easily, we're going to avoid challenge, um, I'm really threatened by other people's successes, versus that growth mindset, which is, you know, I really embrace challenges, I really embrace change, I, I want to learn, I want to do better. Um, so I think some really 
simple ways to illustrate growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Um, one of the biggest lessons that I have learned this past year and a half, and quite frankly, longer than that, but, but I've been reminded of it this past year and a half, um, the idea of I get to versus I have to. Um, it is very easy to wake up in the morning um, after tossing and turning all night and not having a restful night's sleep to think, oh, here we go. I have to, all of the things, right? And when you find yourself thinking that, acknowledge it with no judgment. It's, it's a legitimate response. And then I challenge you to rephrase that to, I get to. Um, you know, having, having experienced the, um, the, the adventure of having been diagnosed with cancer and then going through treatment, um, I really, really realized how much that I took for granted. Um, so something as simple as just being able to do my laundry, right? Who, who, nobody likes to do laundry. Um, it's a task and a chore we wish we didn't have to do. But when I found myself really physically unable to do it, it was something that I had an entirely different appreciation for when I was able to do it again. Um, and I still challenge myself to, you know, practice that I get to instead of I have to, but, but that, that's a, that's a game changer. Um, and then if we think about um, kids, you know, um, hopefully you've read all of this, um, but I think this, it really identifies itself in how we deal with, with our, with our kids sometimes, you know, so, you know, if we think about that fixed mindset, like nothing's working, they just need to calm down, you know, they need to learn self-control, right? Really changing that then to the growth mindset of, well, he really needs some help. How, how can I help? Um, what can I do? Um, does she even know what calm feels like? Um, so how can I help with those self-regulation skills? Um, so I, we already talked about this, I get to instead of I have to. Um, and then ultimately those clinical interventions, again, I'm not going to go through, through this in, in great detail because you guys can read over this later. Um, but some of the main principles of dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, is really that mindfulness and the idea that two things can be true at the same time, right? I, I can be anxious and stressed out and I can feel joy and excitement, um, I can be worried about something and I can know that it's ultimately going to be okay. Um, and that distress tolerance, it's okay not to be okay. Um, and then that practice of um, that distraction um, as a coping skill. Um, so there's some slides on here that just go more into detail um, about dialectical behavioral therapy, some strategies I use with students, um, and just some nice little anagrams. So you guys will have access to those. Um, there's Dear Man is kind of the, the tenant of dialectical behavioral therapy um, with give and fast. So it's just a, a little... Um, a little explanation of, you know, we want to be gentle in our approach. We want to be interested. We want to validate feelings. We want to use humor. So these are really great ways um, you can talk to your kiddos about some things um, that will invite that conversation. So to the parent who is asking about, you know, how, how do I deal with my college student without nagging? These are some really great strategies for how to have some of those conversations. Um, I'm going to skip over this one. Um, so here's some practical applications. Um, everything's not going to work for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Even if something works for you once, it might not work for you the next time. And then the flip side of that, maybe you've tried these things before and they didn't work for you, but I invite you to try them again because you never know when something might work. So some really common things um, that are really helpful, especially with anxiety journaling, talking to someone that you trust, exercising, we've already talked about, that deep breathing and listening to music. And I really like um, this um, idea of, um, you know, a, a guided writing activity. So thinking about your anxiety triggers, thinking about what happened, um, what is my anxious thought? Is that thought factual or is it a lie? Um, what could I think instead? 
um, how can I avoid this trigger in the future or, or what can I do to calm down? Um, so that's just a really nice guided writing activity. Um, you know, we think, again, we talked about just different ways to, to manage um, coronavirus. Um, and then I really also like this idea of thinking about what, what I can do versus what I cannot do, right? And this is great for our kids too. So I can count to five on my fingers and breathe in at a count of five and breathe out at a count of five. I can give myself a big hug and squeeze. Um, I can breathe in pretending like I'm smelling the flowers and breathe out pretending like I am blowing out the candles. Um, I can take a walk. I can sing the words to my favorite song. So going back to that control thinking what we can control and what we can do. We spend a lot of energy on the outside of the circle. We spend a lot of energy thinking about things that we have no control over. So other people, we have no control over any of that versus what can I control? I can control my reactions and my thoughts and my energy. And that takes a lot of practice. Um, these are just some, some um, nice reminders of things we can say to our kids when they're emotional. Right, so we're on the same team, I can help you. I see that you're overwhelmed, that's okay. What do you need? I think sometimes we forget the biggest question we can ask is what, what they need. Um, you know, um, taking, a, taking a break. Um, so these are just some nice things we can say um, that, that are, are beneficial in conversation. And then the other thing is, Thinking about, you know, what gives us energy, there's just some really simple um, life hacks for things that give us energy. Uh, there's been a lot of research done into color and scent. Um, so thinking about colors, um, you know, I, I use the example of when you wake up and you take a shower, what color are your towels? Um, so some people really like uh, red, orange, yellow colors because they're very energizing. And some people gravitate more towards green and blue because they're more calming. Um, so thinking about, you know, what, what visual input are you getting first thing in the morning? And then same thing with scent. Um, citrus has been shown to be an energizing scent. Um, and we, none of us drink enough water. Um, so getting more water in and adding some citrus to that will give you a nice little boost. Laughing increases your endorphins. It's true, it's scientific. Um, so anything that gives you a good laugh or makes you laugh. Um, again, stretching your body, um, listening to music and those random acts of kindness are all different ways to get a little quick energy boost. Um, how, how do we do that? Um, so we all have one of these things, right? We, we all live, live with our phones. Um, so set an alarm, set an alarm for yourself to get up and move every hour. Um, set an alarm every day and title it gratitude and give yourself three minutes to think of three things that you are grateful for. Um, write a letter to someone explaining to them um, why they mean so much to you and, and what it is that they've done to make your life better. And I guarantee you will feel amazing after doing that and so will they. Um, remain open to possibilities, right? You don't always need 20 minutes if you can spend two minutes on it. Um, you don't need to do it every day, but maybe you need to do it two days a week. And, and I love this. Um, I heard once um, that you should meditate for 20 minutes every day, unless of course you don't have 20 minutes and then you should be doing it for 40 minutes every day. And then a couple more things before we wrap up. Um, you are what you eat. This is a like, do as I say, not as I do. My, my diet is top on my agenda of things that I really want to tackle um, in the new year with everyone else. I've, I've taken that literally off my plate to worry about right now. But um, your skin replaces itself every 35 days, which is both gross and fascinating. Um, your liver, your cells, they, they all, um, our bodies are amazing machines and they are fueled by what we put into them. Um, and so in, in times of crisis and being overwhelmed and anxious and stress, we, we tend to go for things that are 
easy and there. Um, and oftentimes those are not the healthiest of choices. So really challenging yourself to, to allow, you know, you to take care of yourself in that way. Um, and then we've, you know, we've, at this point, we've navigated Thanksgiving. So what, whatever that may have looked like, and I know as we head into Christmas and New Year's, there's a lot of thoughts about it's just going to be so different. Um, and so just really thinking about, you know, things that we have control over or things that we can do. Um, so I love this idea of feeling your feelings. The only way out is through, um, which, which is very, very true. Um, we just have to kind of be in it sometime. Opening up to others, realizing you are not the only one who are, who, you know, are, are having these struggles or these thoughts. Um, thinking about what, what new holiday traditions can, can you start? You know, if you've never driven around to look at Christmas lights, maybe this is the year to, to drive around. Um, you know, if, if you've never done a secret Santa gift exchange, maybe this is the year to get a couple of, of friends together or a couple of your kids' friends together and do little secret Santas, dropping little things off on people's doorsteps. Um, again, get, get moving, get outside, even if it's cold, um, fresh air does, does wonders for you. Um, so we kind of talked about all of this already. Um, you know, just some things to, to think about, again, are those routines and structure, um, really encouraging your kids to get involved in, in a different way than they're used to getting involved in, um, and then special considerations, you know, for families that have multiple households and, and how to navigate that and just having those conversations about what everyone is comfortable with right now making sure you are taking time for yourselves. And I know that that's hard, but that's why I, I really want to stress it's, it's not an hour. Sometimes it's five minutes in your driveway, listening to a really great song before you go in the house and transition from one part of your day to another part of your day. Um, there are some links on here. So once you get the PowerPoint, you can just click on these links and it'll take you right to, um, there's a 14 day gratitude journal that I really love. So, um, a couple really nice articles on navigating the holidays and then supporting children and teens. Um, so the national child network, uh, national child traumatic stress network is there, um, I mean, you can Google all of these things, but they're a really, really great resource with some really practical um, examples of things that you can do for your kiddos. Um, so I apologize because most of my resources and links are um, for Will County because that's where I work. Um, so these are all of the people that I work with and that I know. Um, I know we are in Cook County and there's a ton of resources here too. Um, but these are these are accessible and they're not that far away. So um, Linden Oaks and Mokina, um, Trinity Services, both of those are excellent mental health facilities. Um, Will County Health, we you know we have Cook County Health Department as well. Um, Silver Oaks, Rosecrans Counseling Works, again, those are all facilities that offer mental health services. And then there's some community assistance programs. Um, I know that. Um, Again, I have some links here for Will County, but I know in Cook County, there are a, a number of food pantries in Chicago Heights and close, close around. So I, I definitely would encourage you. And I think the school is a great resource for that, um, reaching out to your building social worker um, and really taking advantage of those resources that are available in our community. And then finishing up, I just really want everyone to ask yourselves a couple of these questions, right? We have one life um, that we know of, right? How, how do you want to spend it? Do you want to spend it regretting or questioning or um, hating yourself? Um, do, you, do you want to spend it, you know, um, immersed in all of those things that are taking your energy? Or do you really want to challenge yourself to do those things that bring you energy? Um, and be brave and believe in yourself and, and make time to do what feels good. Um, and it's so easy to get caught up. And before we know it, we're right in the middle of a crisis. And it's very tricky to see your way out of it um, versus looking for these small things every day that we can do that we have control over. 
um, had to put a picture of, of my dog. For those of you that are, are pet people, you know, um, pets can be great. They can get you out of the house and make you go for walks. Um, or they're really great listeners because they can't talk back like kids can. Um, but just thinking of, you know, who, who are your support people? Who can you go to? Who can you talk to? Um, and really utilizing those people. Um, and then at the end here, th there's, this is my work email address. So once you get this, please never um, hesitate to, to reach out. Um, you know, I, in addition to, to being a professional, I'm a, I'm a parent too in, in our community. And so um, I, I really feel very strongly that all of the time, but especially right now is the time to, to use your resources. So please feel free um, to use me as a resource in, in any way um, that, that you need. Um, and with that, I'm gonna leave us with a quote um, from Glennon Doyle, who is just a, a, a beautiful writer and humanitarian. Um, but one of my favorite quotes is just this last line, you can do hard things. Um, and, and I think um, sometimes we just need to be reminded that we can in fact do very hard things, um, even when we don't always think we can. Um, so on that note, I will, I will end it unless there's any other questions or thoughts. Um, yeah, Marie, Marie, I just want to thank you on behalf of Homewood School District 153. Obviously, you're a parent in our community, but I know you're doing this uh, wearing your professional hat this evening. So thank you so much. And also, uh, a huge thank you to the Homewood PTA, who mm -hmm. uh, are the ones who arranged for Marie to come in and speak with our families tonight. Um, I, I found it thoroughly, thoroughly engaging and very helpful. And I know in a year where there's not COVID, the holiday season is traditionally very challenging. It is a stressful time. You throw what all of us have been through the last nine months, and that just further exacerbates things. And um, so thank you so much for all the useful tips. Uh, we certainly will make that available again, not only to the people who are participating tonight and who are able to attend, but also lots of people who are not able to attend that I know would find this information very, very beneficial. So thank you so much. Uh, I believe that's, uh, I did address all the questions that came through, but I also wanna let you know, Marie, that there were a lot of people who said, thank you so much for the evening. So just know that those comments came through repeatedly, okay? Well, thank you so much. And thank you everybody who, again, took, took some time out. So see, you can, you can take some time for yourself. Um, and, and I challenge you to, to, keep, to keep doing that. So thank you so much, Dr. McAllister, I appreciate it. You're, you're certainly welcome. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you for attending. Bye-bye.